So, um, welcome also from me. Um, we're going to listen to Constanze Kurz, and for those of you who don't know Constanze, she's a speaker for the Cars Communication Club. They, <clears throat> they are very instrumental in Germany for uh, many, many things regarding data privacy, and she has been expert witness to the Constitutional Court that finally stopped data retention, uh, first in Germany and then later on in Europe. So that's... But she's also involved in many other legal struggles, and she's going to talk about a bit about this. And just one statement I'd like to give in regarding that. Many of you probably know Lawrence Lessig, who said, code is law, right? Maybe you heard of that. What he meant by that is actually that programming determines many things uh, in our societies. And I think we've come to realize that laws and what governments do also influences very much what we can do with programming and how programming is actually used by the government, by secret services. And that's kind of one of the topics that evolved especially in the last year. And again, Constanze has launched some actions. I think so far in all of the court um, struggles she's, she's been involved at, she had a 100% success rate. Right? <laughs> so that was, um, and I hope she continues with that. And in other news, she's also, um, she's also a co-writer of very interesting books about the increasing automation um, that we have in our societies. The German title is Arbeitsfrei, uh, which means something like out of work, like automated away something like this, and what we can expect in the next 10 years. But this is not the topic of her talk now, but also something uh, she is doing. And so I'm very happy to have her and give the keynote to Constanze. Uh, yeah, thank you, Holger, for the very warm words. And uh, you, of course, for the applause. Uh, since I didn't even start it, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's one year of Snowden, what's next? And I guess um, I'm happy to be back in that building. Uh, as you maybe know, I've been here for quite some years because the hacker community had the really largest European Congress here for quite some years, and so I'm happy to be back. Um, and speaking in front of another tech community about the Snowden World Elevations. It's going to be a mixture of, of course, technical topics, but also questions of legalese and, of course, political questions. Because after that year of relevations, and the relevations will go on, of course, uh, we have to ask some questions. And we should show as a wider tech community that we care and that we don't accept the way it is and that we try to change it. And I will maybe in the end um, of the keynote, I have some ideas what to do about it. Since June last year, we learned more and more about American and British and other spies, deep appetite for data and information, and of course about economic spying, and about the technology they use to collect data as well as their hacking skills, because they also pay a lot of hackers as we know now. And we know that the spies systematically tap international communication on an industrial scale. That's what we know. And the NSA and the GCHQ and uh, the partner services and contractors, metadata repository is capable of store storing billions of transactions and events daily. So the question is, is there a way to defend against an agency like the NSA with a monstrous budget and where 8,500 NSA contractors have access to the data? Thinking about economics buying, as we know now from The Guardian and other papers, 
relevations. After more than one year of Snowden documents, we have to conclude the democratic oversight system failed at each level of oversight. So, then let's see how to fix it, actually. Um, first, we need to analyze what's really going on if we want to fix it, of course. And I want to talk a little bit about the surveillance industry that happens to, to be nowadays. There is a, a study of Privacy International, a research study of surveillance companies that offer their products nowadays. And the study is a collection of what is being sold. It's also a categorization of the technologies and also um, an explanation uh, of what these technologies actually do, can do and cannot do. And those companies, as you see here uh, worldwide, there are 338. They sell different kinds of technologies for surveillance, like cell phone monitoring equipment, interception equipment as in, as in hardware. Of course, technologies for internet monitoring, spyware packages that allow users to take complete control over the computers and over mobile devices. Um, they even buy, uh, sell uh, spyware packages um, for law enforcement mostly or secret services that allow the user to take access to all the data and even the camera and microphones. So that is the status we have today. It's really an industrial complex. And not only monitoring, filtering and censorship technologies, but also passive and offensive hacking tools. Um, Privacy International really did go to the marketplaces and to the fairs, uh, which are uh, worldwide, and uh, took a look at the marketing brochures those, those companies have. We should have that in mind if we think about the Snowden rev rev revelations, because um, there's a reason for all that spying complex, and the reason is simple, simply money. Uh, those companies usually do not take human rights concerns into account or think about the risk of misuse, meaning that their products are used to target pro-democracy activist journalists or any political opposition in regimes or, as we know from the Snowden fights, no, in democracies. Because um, since those technologies in the last decades were used in regimes only, we now know that they are used in democracies as well, and the technical tools to defend against it should not only be used in regimes, but also in democracies. And in the rare case that there are export restrictions, because those companies mostly come from the Western sphere, and if one of the companies can't get any approval to export their surveillance product from one country, then they simply do it from another. That's the way it works today. So we have on a political agenda uh, the question to ask about export regulations of those technologies, not only uh, using it in, in our democracies. Um, as it is the same for the secret services like NSA and GCHQ, this surveillance industry lacks effective oversight or any form of accountability too. So we have a problem that comes together with those uh, industrial surveillance complex and the secret services. But really the start of the Snowden year, um, at least on a worldwide scale, was the PRISM scandal, the PRISM program. What you see here is a picture from Orbit, um, which the NASA took. And artificially, uh, you see the Facebook network plotted on, on, on that photo. And I guess since the PRISM program mostly uh, used uh, social network data and made some videos and video chats and photos, uh, the scandal really emerged because most people felt that they have to care about those PRISM program because everybody, or at least most of the people in the Western world, um, are targeted by those mass surveillance programs. Actually, 
I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Pfizer decision. I come to that later. But most important for me is that uh, that program already started in 2007. So we have the situation that those secret services have a social and communication graph from the whole Western world with a history of some years. What never happened in history of mankind, actually. Uh, they know the communication pattern of everybody uh, who uses that services. And all the companies you see there uh, are cooperating, but they do not do this willingly at most, but they are uh, legally obliged to do so. And that's why I want to talk a little bit about the FISA, the Foreign, Foreign Intelligence, Intelligence Surveillance Act. Uh, because that's kind of the problem which emerged, of course, uh, for those companies. Because this Snowden year is also a, really a trust crisis in not only between the state and the secret services, but also in the rearm of the companies. Um, this worldwide attention to the NSA program in the beginning, it was NSA and FBI and CIA, and not, not the British GCHQ. It started on June 6 last year, as you maybe remember. Glenn Greenwood and even McAskill for The Guardian and Barton Gelman and Laura Poit Poitras for The Washington Post reported on a U.S. domestic collection of foreign internet-related data. And I quote from a Washington Post from this June 6. The National Security Agency and the FBI are tapping directly into the central service of nine U.S. Internet companies, extracting audio, video, chats, photographs, emails, documents, and connection logs that enable analysts to track foreign targets. So it was really, that's why I quoted this from um, um, the law's perspective, it was really in intended to target U.S. citizen, uh, not intended to target U.S. citizen, but us as in Europeans and everybody else who's not U.S. citizen or on U.S. soil. And so the discussion on a political basis today in the U.S. Congress and the U.S. Senate is just about that domestic spying. It's not a question if uh, that that form of spying or mass surveillance will end for people outside uh, U.S. soil or non-U.S. citizen. We ha should, should keep, that, keep that in mind. PRISM is, of course, the system, the internal uh, computer system that collects this data. And that is what two days later, on June 8, the U.S. Director of National Intelligence released in a, in a fact, fact sheet. So uh, what, I, what I speak about here is only what is, where, where is no demente from the U.S. Governance, governance side or from Director of National Intelligence. There are some rare cases in that year of revelation, revelations that um, the U.S. government said, no, here is the reporting not correct, but mostly uh, they didn't even bother to, to write a demente. I want to talk a little bit about... Um, uh, the FISA de decision, because uh, in my opinion, in the public sphere, it's not quite clear to everybody that this form of mass surveillance is uh, legal in the most forms because of that FISA Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Generally speaking, under that FISA, any form of electronic surveillance is permissible if there is a probable cause to believe that the target is a foreign agent or foreign power, and the primary purpose of the investigation is collection of foreign intelligence information. And in Section 218 of Pfizer, even that requirement that foreign intelligence gathering be the primary pur purpose of the investigation was eliminated. Now it only requires that it be a significant purpose. And this act, you maybe read about it in the newspapers, also established a special secret court composed of hand-selected court judges to review the applications for electronic um, uh, surveillance orders. But uh, this secret court hears only the government's evidence. And the FISA court is not revealing any public information 
information concerning electronic surveillance, with the exception of an annual report detailing only the number the request made. So the secret FISA court is also a very silent court. And this silent court and secret court have never refused a single request in its 21-year history uh, until 2002 when the Bounties U.S. Patriot Act became law. So that is, is the kind of uh, oversight we have which completely failed, not speaking about the political oversight, but the judges. Well, but allowing secret trials based on secret evidence with secret outcomes and no public scrutiny to ensure any form of fairness would be a talk on its own. So um, I stopped uh, talking about uh, that, that legal side um, now. Well, speaking of the companies, the cooperating companies, then if a company like Google receives a valid uh, FISA court order, it has, of course, to deliver any information requested, of course. So from that beginning, uh, and it's even after a year, one of the largest scandals and all those revelations, um, they emerged in an interesting di discussion about metadata. You see on that picture um, an example. This is from a Greek scandal some years ago where the whole government, um, the president and the ministers uh, were tapped. And... Um, um, this is a press conference, actually, a picture from a press conference where they plotted from uh, one of those uh, surveillance software products so that you see what metadata um, will, be, will be seen at the screen. Of course, if you have it on a computer, you can um, um, interact, of course, with that. It's just um, the problem is that metadata and most of that uh, surveillance stuff is really, it's abstract. Um, in, in a way, I mean, it's not really, uh, you, you, you cannot really feel the surveillance. If you sit in a cafe and there's somebody really staring, staring at you the whole time, then you would maybe say, stop doing that. Uh, don't look at my screen, don't, don't listen to my phone calls. But if you have that metadata discussion, it's not the same as surveillance in a, in a, a physical world. So what, what's really at risk here, most people don't, most people don't realize. But um, the metadata discussion uh, goes on until now, and maybe we will have um, a decision about that um, from the U.S. Supreme Court later that year or in the next year that is possible. I come back to that metadata later. Of course, uh, why they are interested in that metadata so much is because it's significantly easier to collect and store because of the volume of the data, and it's much easier to detect any anomaly, meaning anomalies in personal communication behavior, like is there a person starting to communicate with each other? Is it maybe on, is it maybe in nighttime? So you can have filters or triggers in any form to detect those anomalies um, and ask maybe for a special identifiers like phone number or uh, email numbers. And it's of course, uh, it's optimal for uh, any form of automatic filtering. So that metadata discussion is not over now. Of course in uh, Europe, metadata belongs uh, to uh, the data that is protected by the right to privacy. It's maybe not the same in the US, but we will maybe see from a uh, court decision uh, this or next year. After the first revelations about the PRISM program and the starting metadata discussion, General Keith Alexander, the then director of the NSA, which is, uh, of course, a general, uh, because the head of the NSA is always a military guy, confirmed in two public hearings of US Congressional Intelligence Review Committees that the NSA collect both domestic and international telephone call metadata from all major US carriers and maintains a database of all such calls for five years. So we now know, but actually that is for all the revelations that I speak about here. We just know nothing really changed. Um, there is an initiative right now in the U.S. Congress to change some of some of those programs, but actually it's just uh, for domestic spying. It's not for European. Let's 
let's say not for us. Um, the next, the next uh, step in that scandal, which is uh, the third one from, 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 or I believe that that it's um, one of the largest scandal, is a tempora program. What you see here are undersea cable, a commercial undersea cable, uh, which we have today. Uh, you see a little uh, anomaly because um, if you uh, would have an undersea cable today, then you maybe wouldn't wouldn't choose that route from um, UK to New York over the ocean, but that came from the telegraph lines uh, more than 100 years ago. And as the tele uh, telegraph lines um, were invented, actually, uh, they didn't know very much about uh, the underground of the ocean, so they just took a direct route. And the, that is the reason that more than 85% uh, um, maybe of all um, the connections between the European continent and the Americas uh, goes through the British island and that's why uh, with the Tempora program the GCHQ started to be part of the scandal that is uh, the British, uh, one of the British spy agencies. Mm. GCHQ uh, wasn't actually exaggerating when it invented the phrase mastering the internet which is the name of one of the programs as to be found in the Snowden documents. Within those Tempora program, some 300 GCHQ plus 250 NSA agents have the task to analyze the data that goes or flows through the undersea cables. And this is, uh, this is stored up for up to three days for content and up to 30 days for metadata because the volume is, of course, um, not that high. You see, uh, we, we talk about um, a 20 petabyte, that means million gigabytes in that three days. And those events, it's really the stuff we do every day on our mobile phones and over the internet. So it's not an event like a technical term, but it's our communication and our emails and our photos and stuff. And of course, it's the same as in the prison program, the cooperating companies, uh, which are not only uh, the well-known uh, companies like British Telecom or um, Verizon, it's also the backbone providers because, uh, of course, part of the Tempora program are uh, hardware devices um, uh, on the places where the undersea cable um, land on, on British soil. Uh, as we know, most of the bits we click is BitTorrent, uh, YouTube and YouPorn, of course. Uh, and to reduce the sheer volume of the data running through the undersea cables, um, like peer-to-peer -peer downloads, um, it's discarded, of course, by filters. And this reduces the volume um, about uh, by, by 30%, maybe. And those filters, um, not only reducing uh, the data volume, but also uh, are triggered by words by email addresses or phone numbers. So the data stream is actually filtered, categorized, and, and stored if it's of any interest. All in all, GCHQ and NSA, which work as a, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's more like, um, it's really close working together, at least in, in the Tapoa program. And they use around 40,000 of those uh, triggers uh, to filter and analyze the data that, is low, that flows over the undersea cable. So, mm, we know that for a year now, and the question for all the European countries, and not only Europe, but worldwide actually, is what we're going to do about it. Uh, we talk about the Tempora program here in Europe a lot, but there's also uh, an exact um, dupli duplicate of that program for the PACnet, which is a, a Asian Pacific uh, undersea cable net. So it's actually a worldwide undersea cable uh, surveillance program. Uh, for my opinion, at least in Germany, the public debate, it's not only Germany, it's, it's worldwide, I guess, really changed when one prominent German person 
and the, her mobile phone was tapped. And to me, it's until now a, a scandal that um, only this one tapping of a mobile phone, which is uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel, of course, um, is really a scandal in a political sphere and not the mass surveillance and the offensive hacking techniques we learn from. And Ah, okay, I see you agree. Uh, and since I don't have the time to follow that uh, chronology of that year step by step, because you could really uh, need five hours for that, I just want to have a short break and tell you just in some words what happened afterwards until maybe um, the end of the year, because I guess uh, you remember from reading the newspaper what happened in this year. After uh, June 21, where GCHQ's Tempora tapping fiber optic cables uh, became known, which was from The Guardian, in July we also had a attack list, a target list, reported by The Guardian about cyber attacks. Uh, that was a list of uh, quite a lot of targets worldwide. Uh, in July, we also learned that the NSA is spying explicitly in Asia, in Hong Kong, and there are also hacking attempts um, against China, and that the U.S. hacked PACnet, which is uh, the Asian Pacific Fiber Optic Network, as I, as I mentioned. And not only from uh, one year or two, but from 2009 on. In July 31, we also learned about X-Key score, which is a central tool the NSA uses um, to aggregate nearly everything um, from the internet as The Guardian wrote. Uh, in August, it was just one month later, and uh, we all thought it's summer and maybe the revelation stopped. Uh, we learned about even more cyber attacks by the US, um, mostly NSA, and that were 231 offenses operations even in one year. And in September, the first time there was really blood on the data because we learned from an article in the Washington Post that the NSA has ties to the US drone attack then, and that metadata and content data explicitly uh, were dumped into the US drone program. That, mean, that means uh, that the data um, triggered the CIA-driven drone program and, um, well, where the Reaper and Predator drone with the Hellfire rocket were sent to mobile phones to deliver the bombs. So actually, that was not really reported in, in Europe very much, but uh, in the US uh, it was reported from the Washington Post, as I said, um, and I guess um, that is a discussion we should uh, we should follow closely because I think uh, in this year 2014 we will have more of those connections between uh, the CIA drone program and the metadata and content data collection of the NSA because uh, if you want to fire a Hellfire rocket then uh, you need the data to know which mobile phone to target. In September, we even had the first uh, cyber war attack as defined by the NATO, uh, NATO. Uh, and that was as the GCHQ targeted and spied on Belgacom, um, which the Spiegel reported. Actually, Belgacom is uh, one of the main telecom carriers in, in Belgium. And the GCHQ passively sniffing, hacked, some of the maintainers of that network and faked LinkedIn pages to target those engineers and they had success and that is really a cyber war attack as defined by the NATO uh, against another NATO country which is Belgium. That was really interesting because that kind of attack was the first time we heard about that. Um, we even had a in October, that was in October uh, 2nd, um, uh, location data scandal, 
but it wasn't really reported worldwide because um, the NSA collection, a mass collection of US cell phone location data was only reported in English and uh, not so much uh, on the European country. So we see we have also, of course, um, not only the communication and social graph from PRISM, but also a geolocation uh, program uh, which runs geolocation uh, profiles, of course. Um, maybe I stop here. I mean, you can read it in the newspapers. And I guess as I, uh, as I took, took a look of all the papers I'm, I'm researching for that scandal for about a year now, um, some of uh, those reports in uh, the different newspapers, not only uh, American and European, but also uh, Brazilian and Asian newspapers, uh, I simply forget because uh, all the small scandals in between are really forgotten when you think about the really big scandals we have here and uh, the lack of, of oversight for that uh, mafia-like um, secret service complex. Well, what we learned from that chron chronology, and I took it on one slide because I uh, um, wanted to have it in one place, uh, that, that's what we learned over the months. These are our priorities as and targets from those uh, NSA programs. As you clearly see, these are the top terrorists uh, we have in the world. Uh, the targets are the EU institutions and uh, also the parliament. 80 embassies worldwide, heads of foreign governments, uh, and two uh, from those heads we know by name. This is the Brazilian uh, President Rousseff and, uh, and the German Chancellor Merkel. We also have the top terrorists at the G20 meetings, uh, which were tapped. Um, they even, uh, in the G20 meetings, they even uh, invented fake internet cafes to uh, to grab the passwords of uh, the teams uh, of the politicians meeting at the G20. Um, also the OPEC, uh, the World Bank, large companies like the Brazilian Petrobras, so we have a list of uh, priorities here, but we have even more. We also have, uh, from the revelation, the National Intelligence Priority Framework. And this is a, a kind of matrix from, that's just the part you see here, and you don't have to read it, I, I copied it, uh, you see it in the next slide. Um, it's a matrix of targets as in contents. What is really, what kind of topics are those secret service interested? And you would maybe oh, wait for national security issues, but I copied it uh, for Germany from that uh, framework. And what you see here uh, are the targets in that framework. That is cyber attack, counter espionage, emerging strategic technologies, clearly a top terrorist problem, international trade policy, arms export, arms control, foreign policy objectives, economic and financial stability. So it's really uh, what we learned from that year is that it's much more about economic spying than the political discussion and the discussion in the newspaper is about. They always uh, argue with the questions of national security, but as we know from the revelations, it's much more about economic spying. And actually, the scandals are much more about power and uh, access to information um, than about national security. Mm. And if you see the ideology behind that, and I, uh, I quote that from the Deputy Attorney General, uh, James Cole, then you have that uh, metaphor of the haystack. He said, if you're looking for a needle in the haystack, you have to get the haystack first. And what we learned from all those programs uh, is that the uh, piling even more hay, and what we also learned, and I come to that in a minute, is pi that, that, that piling on more hay doesn't really help to find the needle. Um, but before I, I come back to uh, that ideology, I want to talk a little bit about the dimension of what we actually fight against now, and that is part of the revelations too. It's a so-called black budget, then 
um, in German, most most German, at least, yeah, most German uh, countries, you know about the budget those secret services um, as in as in money or receive. Um, when we have the 19 German secret services, so we, we know as a population what, what money we spent on that. Um, that was different in the United States, so uh, the Black Budget revelation was really interesting to take a look at um, U.S. national intelligence uh, um, budget. And that is, of course, you see it here, uh, over 50 billion dollar a year, and that is, uh, much more than even uh, than even some of the politicians in the review committees um, knew. As I talked to William Binney, who's been here in Berlin, because we have the commission in the um, German Bundestag, the NSA Untersuchungsausschuss, um, we talked about that budget on a um, on, a, on a podium here in Berlin, and he said, "Okay, that uh, 50 billion dollar per year." Uh, it's not sufficient. And I looked at him like, what do you mean not sufficient? It's not that much or even more. And he said, it's even more because some uh, of the secret service budgets are in, uh, let's say in uh, military stuff. It's, it's hiding somewhere. He said in his active time in the NSA, the budget was already 80 billion dollar per year and he said that some years ago so it's maybe even more that meaning he he corrected that budget above uh, but i was uh, i was really staring at him at that moment because i thought uh, 50 billion dollar was quite a lot if if you think about how many nurses uh, you could pay from that or how many rockets you can send to the moon from that from that money. Um, I'm running a little bit out of time, um, but I'm, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the tailored exit operation, because uh, the most of the scandal in uh, the public sphere talked about the mass surveillance, metadata, content data, and the, you know, the little and the, the larger scandals. But for me as a hacker, it's uh, of course interesting uh, what they do um, in the tailored access operations and what kind of exploits they really have and what are the methods actually that they are using. Um, in the Snowden papers, we now know that the TAO, tailored access operations, have um, has exploited against Windows, Mac OS, Linux and iOS and some more which are unnamed and that some of those um, exploits um, are really zero-day exploits, uh, but most of them are known. So um, they spent maybe quite a lot of money to to have access to those exploits. And we also learned actually that uh, the gray and black market for um, computer vulnerabilities or mobile phone vulnerabilities and malware of all kinds um, that that. A gray market is uh, paid uh, from those secret service budgets. So we wouldn't even have uh, that gray and black market on that large scale if they wouldn't spend that money on that. They uh, had, had different methods uh, within that TAO um, uh, operation, that meaning, of course, backdoors, that's what we expected. Uh, it was a manipulation of random number generators, uh, because that's a good way to weaken encryption. Uh, they had an intensive cooperation with NIST. NIST is a standard institute uh, who every, uh, where every 10 years new encryption uh, standards are somewhat invented. I shouldn't say invented, but uh, NIST um, was really um, releasing a press statement and in some parts uh, they said, yes, we did cooperate um, with secret services. They even tried uh, for that part of the data collection they had, which was encrypted, to get the master encryption keys with different methods and the uh, programs they have for that called uh, Bull Run for the NSA and Edge for the GCHQ. Uh, they have really $255 million a year and it's 
if you think about it, in fact, an anti-security program. And it undermines, of course, the trust we have and the IT systems we use every day. That was really interesting uh, to, to learn about the offensive strategies uh, from those um, secret services. They really have a lot of hackers and that, they, that they pay. And um, it's really hard to change, um, to change it on the on the, on the ide ideological uh, way. Because if you take a look at the British and the American hacker community, it's quite common uh, to work for some years for NSA contractors or even for the NSA itself. It's maybe very different from the European habits. Well, we heard all that, and I, I missed a lot of revelations because I don't have time to, to collect them all here. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about the success. So what about national security? And I copied this from the so-called White House panel, which uh, U.S. President uh, Barack Obama um, initiated as a commission, um, really run by um, secret service veterans. And even those secret service guys who clearly belong to the intelligence community uh, wrote this uh, in their report. Um, the metadata of the telecommunication brings only a modest contribution to the nation's security, and there has been no instance in which NSA could say with confidence that the outcome of a terror investigation would have been any different without the metadata. So the stupid phrases we heard in the beginning of that scandal that all that mass surveillance, explicitly metadata, but also content data, would help against terrorist attack is quite nonsense. And we see it in the White House report and the intelligence community itself, who is sitting in that commission, uh, stated it in its own report. That was really interesting and as you maybe as you maybe know, it uh, wasn't really reported, at least not in German. Uh, you maybe know, and I'm coming to the optimistic part of the talk now, right? Yeah? Uh, they also targeting a tour. We know from October where the presentation, the NSA presentation tour stings um, were published, that uh, tour is really targeting. Tor is an anonymizing network, as you maybe know. And this July, uh, uh, the German ARD and the Süddeutsche Zeitung had a publication um, that explicitly uh, target users, uh, tour users are targeted. Well, that was really interesting because they released some of the filter rules for the deep packet inspection, which the NSA and the GCHQ used to uh, have triggers for every Tor user, and not only Tor user, but also people who search for information about Tor. Um, that was really uh, interesting because right now Tor is the only affordable and reliable technology for people uh, in, for example, China or Iran to communicate encrypted and anonymized with the rest of the world. Uh, one of uh, those Tor servers is operated by the Chaos Computer Club here in Germany. And so uh, the data traffic to and from uh, those uh, so-called Tor directory servers um, is being taken into the um, repositories of the NSA. And that was the reason that we uh, filed, again, a criminal complaint against Angela Merkel, ministers in Germany, the head of the secret services in Germany and foreign secret services, and mostly everybody who uh, could be maybe um, responsible for that, because I guess um, at least we don't, don't only need political help and we need technical tools to fight against those uh, NSA mass surveillance and uh, especially targeted surveillance like that one. But we also should use uh, the laws existing. And that's why we fight a criminal complaint against those aggressive surveillance uh, in Germany directly. And we just hope that uh, the General Bundesanwalt, the state federal prosecutor, I guess, Harald Ranger, um, 
or maybe do his job and uh, ask the NSA and the GCSQ some questions. And so. I'm not quite sure if this will work out, but we even, uh, we even tried. Um, I want to wanna talk a little bit, and that's uh, the last thing I want to wanna talk about, um, a little about other ways to defend against those mass surveillance. And a quote here from a GCHQ memo from May 2012, where the GCHQ um, said our main concern is that references to agency practices, meaning the scale of interception and deletion, could lead to damaging public debate which might lead to legal challenges against the current regime. And the scale of interception and retention required would be fairly likely to be challenged on Article 8, the right to privacy grants. And that is exactly what we did. Because um, the Article 8 uh, is part of the European Human Rights Convention. And the UK, different uh, from the US, of course, ratified uh, that convention uh, in 1951. So it's bounded to that convention. And a Big Brother Watch uh, open rights group and uh, the English pen and myself, we uh, had a joint application to the European Court of Human Rights in, in Strasbourg. So we try to go the legal way Though I think uh, we should protect ourselves on a technical way um, to begin with, of course. Um, maybe in the end of July we will know a little bit more um, from the court because we, until now, we have a so-called Rule 41, which means that all cases are prioritized. Uh, but um, actually, the court. Um, although we have that fast track, um, I stopped the process a little bit because of uh, the British Tribunal, uh, which is a, also a secret court um, on UK soil, where groups like uh, Privacy International um, try to make a case too. And so they, they waited for that outcome. So we just know maybe in a few days um, where the case goes. We just right now have um, a catalog of questions for the uh, British government and uh, also for the German government, because I'm a German citizen, but um, until now the German government decided to not really answer any of the questions. Um, but I guess it's um, just a legal way and we should try that. And I'm really very satisfied that a lot of people, thousands of people, uh, spent money on that cases. We had in just 48 hours uh, the 20,000 pounds we needed for that case together. And little, uh, little, which is five or six euro, come from all, all over Germany. And in just 48 hours we, we had that, the sum we needed together. It was, I'm, I'm very proud of that and I feel um, that different from the opinion you, you read in the newspaper, people actually care and they are, they, they want to support, that's, that's, that's our fear at least. But uh, the legal way is one thing and to put political pressure on those responsible for that. But I think as a tech community, uh, first of all, we should use encryption and not only use it, but implement it. That is what we should do in our normal working habits. Because we should, we as a technical community should help the normal user because he will rely on us uh, to have working encryption because the NSA mass surveillance programs, uh, they doesn't scale. If just 10 or 15% of users really switch encryption on, they get blinded and that's what we actually should do. So. So, that's uh, actually what I demand from you. Use encryption, but not only use it, but um, implement it. And be as transparent as possible when using encryption in technologies or software you, you build. That is, uh, 
I guess, to rebuild the trust that is lost, that is essential for that. So be as transparent as you can. We should not only <laughs> cut, <laughs> we should not only cut the budgets of the professional peeping tongs, but also raise the standards in general for the government to look at everyday communication data, metadata, content data, purchase records, medical records, and so on. Because by its very nature, mass surveillance is neither necessary nor proportionate. Because these technologies enable the violation of human rights. It's a human rights issue, particularly the right to privacy and also uh, the human right of uh, freedom of expression. So eavesdropping on that massive scale is simply not acceptable in free society. So let's fight it. Thank you. I'm not quite sure, Holger. Are we supposed to have a question and answer? I don't know. I, I don't want to be that negative. I hope you have an optimistic feeling right now. <laughs> so there, there are two microphones. You can go over there or here. We have like, let's say, five minutes and then we... Is this thing on? Yes. It is. Uh, Thank you for these amazing insights. Thank you. I have two questions, which are actually basically one. What would happen if one of these companies at some point just says, um, no? And what would happen if all these companies, their CEOs come together and they make the agreement and they say, no? Can you tell me? Can you, do you have any insights into that? Well, um well, that is not, not such a trivial question. It's a really complex question, actually. <laughs> the point yeah. is, I have uh, maybe to, to um, remind you that uh, law interception techniques are built into all commercial telecommunication networks by law, and they have standards, so-called Etsy standards. So uh, the technique to intercept is, from a legal perspective, necessary to be a commercial telecom carrier in all Western countries. Meaning that uh, the possibility is already there. And from a legal perspective, um, not only the US companies, but in, in many European countries too, they are simply obliged to hand over the data. What they could do actually is to switch on encryption to not lock any content and in that way help the users a little bit. What they actually do right now, mostly in the US, is of course write open letters because they, they see um, that, this, that, the, that the trust crisis um, is a question of economy right now in the European and Asian markets because they see that uh, mostly uh, the cloud, um, as a cloud um, uh, companies, um, that, um, well, it, it really drops. Um, the partners, uh, not even, not even, they ha don't have a lot of new contracts, but they also have a second contracts uh, from Asian and European partners demanding from the US companies that they have special privacy uh, contracts to the normal cloud contract and stuff. And so the pressure from the economic sphere to the US administration uh, it's getting higher, so maybe that 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 trust crisis will be not not will be not solved in a political realm, but in an economic realm. We have a lot of small companies who says uh, who say, okay, um, we build our technology that way that we can't hand over data, uh, like in the Tor network uh, or or other examples. But uh, really, the the huge telecom carriers and internet uh, companies, they don't have a choice. Well, it's interesting because if you step out for a moment and you look at what's happening, it's basically, 
it's the nation state, an institution with an army, uh, which is very powerful, of course. But it's interesting to think what would actually happening, be happening on the enforcement side of things if a group of these companies just agree not to participate. Well, they actually do. Point is that we, as users, we tend to use the large companies. So maybe I urge you to think more decentralized. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, uh, we're here at the Python conference. Um, Guido Van Rossen, the creator of Python, has been working in a company that makes sure we all have our data secure, our most important data secure, uh, for the last three years. Uh, this company has just acquired a new member of the board of directors, which is Condoleezza Rice, uh, one of the main supporters of massive surveillance, which is working at the same company of the guy who created this beautiful language. What are your thoughts about it? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, what you're referring to is actually the so-called revolving door, right? Is that what, what you meant? The so-called revolving door that, uh, that you have is um, uh, a lot of people who switch between companies, contractors, secret services and stuff. That's, that's what you mean? Uh, I mean Dropbox. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't really get well, you, I'm sorry. Well, sorry. Uh, Dropbox is a company where a you can keep, oh, yeah, oh, you can uh, keep uh, uh, all your ah. most important files uh, in the cloud. Well, yeah. uh, Guido Van Rassen is working, the creator of Python, is working for that company for the last three years. This company just uh, uh, added a new member to the board of directors, which is Condoleezza Rice, one of the main supporters of massive surveillance, one of the one of the people who explained that it's necessary to have some. Yeah. Uh, no, I got you. Of course, I read it in the news. Um, um, and maybe um, since uh, at the Hope Hope Ten in, in New York. Um, Edward Snowden referred uh, to that case, so maybe yes. most people are aware now. Well, I don't have really any, any, any good comment on that. I guess it's um, not the only case, I feel. I think it's just something we should all think about and maybe talk to Gig yeah. about it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay.